Greetings. How's everybody doing today? Who we? Boy, oh boy. Life is good. Life is good. This is Doc Ock at noon and nine coming to you over the Black Facts channel for another noontime session. And we do have some. Oh, we've got a we got a live stream. More like a live wire. But let's get started. Let's do our due diligence here and start with our proverb of the day. Now, you may have heard this one before. You may not. But if you have, you can always hear it again. Repetition is good. Proverb for the day. In a court of fowls, the cockroach never wins his case. In a court of fowls, the cockroach never wins his case. And that's a proverb from Rwanda Burundi. At one time, apparently they were a colony that was that was joined. OK, two different nationalities, specifically uh, Rwanda and Burundi. So poem for today, going along with our theme of adventures and our theme uh, for the week of space exploration. Going to delve into some space exploration here for a minute. Poem for the day is very interesting poem. I remember from back in the day, but I hadn't, I don't think I've read it yet during these live streams. And it's a, I'm reverting back to poet of last month, Gil Scott here. And I know I said I was going to do all my poems this month, but this one was too good to pass up. And it's called, where is that poem at? Hmm. Okay. Do, 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 do. There you go. Page 42. Let's see what we got here today. The poem is called Whitey on the Moon. Whitey on the Moon. And then we're going to have a little discussion. It'll be a monologue because since y'all can't respond readily, uh, we'll have a little monologue on Whitey on the Moon and why am I reading this poem today? Whitey on the Moon. A rat done bit my sister Nell with Whitey on the Moon. Her face and arms began to swell and Whitey's on the Moon. I can't pay no doctor bill, but Whitey's on the moon. Ten years from now, I'll be paying still while Whitey's on the moon. The man just upped my rent last night because Whitey's on the moon. No hot water, no toilets, no lights, but Whitey's on the moon. I wonder why he upping me because Whitey's on the moon. I was already paying him 50 a week with Whitey on the moon. Taxes taking my whole damn check. Junkies making me a nervous wreck. The price of food is going up. And as if all that crap wasn't enough, a rat done bit my sister Nell with Whitey on the moon. Her face and arm began to swell, but Whitey's on the moon. Was all that money I made last year for Whitey on the moon? How come there ain't no money here? Hmm, Whitey's on the moon. You know, I just about had my feel of Whitey on the moon. I think I'll send those doctor bills to Whitey on the moon. Yeah, I think I'll send those doctor bills to Whitey on the moon. Because a rat done bit my sister Nell. And that really is making me feel like hell. Not to mention the smell. Okay. So, why am I reading that poem today? Seems somewhat out of context, but it's not. We were talking about my girl here, Mae Jemison. And I will be reading more tonight from the book she wrote on the 100-year starship, which is a, a, it's a starship initiative. She's heading up this initiative. So she's the... Uh, lead researcher in developing 
this program and in, in, in terms of this whole program it's not it's not not designed to actually build the ship but the components that you would need in order to be able to travel to a distant star like that like in a starship at warp speed like sister uhuru uhura over here behind me so that's where we're at today but if you recall when i started out on this track I said something about uh, my concern that as we develop things, as things like this develop, that where were black folks going to be? Because it seemed like we were, we've been very few and far between when you deal with the imagination machine. I'm talking about Hollywood, the imagination machine, the machine that controls all of our thought patterns the machine that controls all of our vision, the machine that controls all of our uh, dreams, okay? Even our dreams are controlled by or influenced by that uh, vision machine called Hollywood. That when you see um, these uh, futuristic movies, TV shows, Lost in Space, etc., we saw no black people. Now in the, the new Lost in Space, if you look at the new Lost in Space, you can see it on Netflix, you'll notice there's a black woman there. But the story is kind of, um, what's the word for it? Thin. The story is very thin. Dr. Um, Dr. Smith, we know how he becomes, or she, whatever. He, yeah, I think it's a, is it he or she this time. I can't remember. But we know how Dr. Smith becomes a part of the, Lost in Space team. We, we that part was pretty clear because it was it was very close to the original. We know how the the mother and the father and the child we, we and the, and the and the teenager we we know we know how they got involved. So, but there's one extra character they added in one extra character for the present that's black, with no backstory, no explanation of where the hell did she come from? Did she? Was the did the mama have an affair? Did they adopt her? Did she was she orphaned or something? No, no backstory for the black girl. So all the these kinds of things, when I see them, they trigger a remembrance of the time when Gil Scott Heron wrote this poem I just read, Whitey on the Moon. Because he wrote that poem specifically because. Whenever they talked about space, we never, ever, ever, really ever, they didn't talk about black folks. Matter of fact, before they would put a black man in a space capsule in Russia or the U.S. in space, the dog got to go. They even put a monkey in space now you know you know you know how you know how monkeys are anytime you see a monkey in a cartoon like that one they did on obama do you remember that hit job they did on obama where they showed the police shooting this monkey and you know and the monkey was being identified basically as obama okay so to put a monkey in space before they put a black man in space actually said a lot because what qualifications did the monkey have to have? Did the monkey have to have a degree? Did the monkey have to go to flight school? Did the monkey have to uh, be able to pilot a uh, uh, anything? Did the monkey even have a driver's license? Could the monkey drive a car? So the monkey didn't have to have no qualifications, but the monkey could go into space. I believe on multiple occasions. I think there was even more than one monkey that went into space. I'll be checking on that. I'll get back with that between now and the end of the week. So a number of creatures could get into space before a black man. And what was the reason that the black man couldn't get into space? Just one. Being black was good enough. So a lot of symbolism was involved in that whole space program thing that we don't think about. This is the other side of 
where we're at now with Mae Jemison heading up a research team. But what happened before that? How did we get here? And what what changed that shifted things to where you could have a black woman doing something like what Mae's doing and be, be a very public figure as opposed to, say, Katherine Johnson, who was definitely a hidden figure. Even when I read the uh, the book about her the other day, the depictions of her looked quite different. Didn't look anything like this woman here because in the book, she was about my complexion, okay? And here we can see Katherine Johnson is very light, damn near white. You can't tell that the woman is black, but that didn't stop her from being discriminated against. She still got treated the same way the rest of us got treated for the most part. So this whole story of the space race, they talk about putting the first man on the moon. So we've heard that story before. They talk about the first man in space. We've heard that story before. Uh, the first man to orbit the, the the earth and how many times it went around. We didn't hear that. We heard about Buzz Aldrin. We didn't heard about uh, uh, John Glenn, who became a, a U.S. senator, et cetera, et cetera. So we didn't heard about all that. But what have we heard about the black men that got into space? Now, here is your black fact for today. Who was the first black man to go into outer space? Who was the first black man to go in outer space? So look that up. I'm going to come black tomorrow with the answer to that particular question because there's some things I got to do before I can uh, expound on that, okay? Because I want to come back with, because it's it's very difficult to find to that question. That's a hidden figure that is, is still hidden. The first black man to go into space. So today, for the rest of our time here today, which we only have a few minutes left, okay? I'm going to go ahead and just... You know what? I think I will. Um, yeah. I'm going to just kind of give you a synopsis of what's in this book right here. OK. And this book talks about some black people that went into space before Mae Jemison. But we're not, I'm not going to try to read through the whole thing or anything like that. I'm just going to kind of pick and choose. But we'll start off with the picture on the front. I'm trying to remember. There's one person's name I don't remember because I don't know him as well. Okay, but we'll get to his name in a minute. Okay, so here you have three black men, three astronauts, three black astronauts from the United States. And you see all the way over here, you see Ron McNair. This is the brother that went up on the uh, spaceship on the, um, on the um, space shuttle Challenger that was in that Challenger explosion. So he passed away, bless his soul. Um, then you see over here, Guy and Bluford, who has an Ohio connection, I'm just realizing. And we'll get, we'll get more information on that later. And then over here, this one here, I can't quite remember his name. I know now that his first name is Frederick, but I don't remember his last name. So the, the name of that one, I don't read. Oh, here it is. No, nope. they don't mention his name here, right here either. But I'll get, we'll get to that. So these are three, the three, three of the first black astronauts that actually got into the program and went into space on multiple occasions. Um, even though Ron McNair was killed in that accident, that terrible Challenger accident, uh, he still did make it into outer space. So he had been on more than one. That wasn't his first trip to the rodeo. It definitely wasn't his first mission. Okay. Now, um, 
Yeah, let's deal with this right here. I'm going to read from the flap right on the inside. This is part of my speed reading technique. Okay, you look at the cover, then you read these flaps, and maybe we'll read the part here in the back too. But we'll, we'll read this part right here for sure. Black stars in orbit. NASA's African-American astronauts. At 2.32 a.m. on August 30, 1983, the space shuttle Challenger lifted off on NASA's 39th manned space mission. For the first time in the space program, an African-American colonel, Guyan S. Bluford Jr., was part of the crew. Today, NASA can boast a handful of black astronauts. But African-Americans have not always been welcome in this highly visible role. Although African-American scientists worked behind the scenes to make America's early space missions possible, no black astronauts flew on those flights. It was not until 1976 that a NASA campaign to find black trainees was launched, leading to the recruitment of two Air Force colonels and the civilian scientists who would become the first African-Americans to journey into space. Black Stars in Orbit is the inspiring story of those three men and African-Americans who have followed them and taken their place in the forefront of space exploration and discovery. See, it comes back to that. Remember I said I was going to avoid that word exploration, but sometimes you still it's still going to pop up in the text. OK, that's not where the angle I'm coming from, but it's still it's still with us. OK, it's still with us. so let's see what they say on the back. Oh, here it is here. Here goes the name. This is the uh, third party. The one I mentioned over here, this brother over here, Frederick Gregory. OK, so on the back, they got a quote from him. And he says. Hmm, get my glasses on here. There we go. All right. Now. You just get a marvelous view of the world from space. I was 190 miles up. You see a lot of the world. I guess so, right? And of course, you're going around every 90 minutes. And so you see it very rapidly. And you see it over and over again. And the thing that impressed me was that you could see Houston. And then you'd see how really close Houston was to Mexico City. And how close Mexico City was to South America, to Africa, to Russia. Everything was right there. But the great thing about it was that unlike the Rand McNally maps, there were no state boundaries. You kind of wondered from above as you looked down and you passed over what appeared to be city to city, but was actually continent to continent, how there could be any problems at all down there because everybody was everybody's neighbor. So as you can see, without even getting all the way deep into the book, you can already feel the theme coming on. OK, so I'm going to read a little bit just from the beginning. Uh, by the way, this book was written by two people, uh, Kepra Burns, Kepra Burns and William Miles. And uh, both of them for both of them, this was their first book, but they also did a movie. OK, and we'll talk about that later, too. And the book was written in when 1995. So this book is 1995 vintage. So let's see what they got to say here. Now, the, the story of space flight is connected to other modes of transportation because before you could get to uh, thinking about going out into space, there was the development of the airplanes. OK, ways that you could fly uh, in a vehicle just above the Earth, but not going further out into space and going into orbit, etc. So on the wings of a dream, the longing to fly, the soar like like the birds is one of the oldest and most deep seated of human dreams and desires. Ancient Greek mythology tells of a master craftsman named Daedalus who constructed wings out of wax and feathers for himself and his son Icarus, trapped in an elaborate and winding maze on the island of Crete. They planned 
to use their wings to escape and return home to Athens in freedom. But young Icarus was overcome by the sheer exhilaration of flying. And although warned against it, he flew a little bit too high and too close to the sun. The wax melted, his wings disintegrated, and he fell from the skies into the cold, churning sea below. In African-American folklore, there's the story of Robin, Robin McQueen, Katie, old man Jacob King, and others from Africa who were brought to America as slaves and forced to labor on plantations in the sea islands off the coast of Georgia and South Carolina. One day, they, when they were out in the fields, they decided they'd had enough of slavery, so they threw down their hose and stopped working. The overseer got out his whip and was going to flog them. But before he could strike the first blow, they all rose up into the air like birds and flew back to Africa where they could be free. Mm. And that's where we start our story at today. We started there, we ended there because our time is already up. But... um. You know, as I do these stories, I told you before that it's a it's a process of discovery for me as much as it is, as it is for you. I've been following the space program from the very beginning. Uh, I've been following it, you know, building the rockets. We, my dad and I, we built the Mercury Redstone. We built the Apollo uh, 9, I think it is. We built uh, and we flew them. We, we had a rocket. We made fl that flew. We built airplanes. You know, so this has been a an interest of mine, an area of interest for a long time. This is nothing new. But even though that's the case, even though it's been an area of interest for, of mine for a very long time, I can still learn something new every single day. And tomorrow, I got a story for you all. You better tune in, tell your friends, because I got one here that's going to blow your socks off. All right. In the meanwhile, uh, you know what to do. Sign up, subscribe, give us a like, thumbs up. And of course, you see our donation button down there at the bottom. We're still looking for more donations. If You, you can either donate there, right through the button down below, or you can go to our donation page on our website. Either way, we hope that all, everybody out there has a good day. And uh, at the end of the day, that you're still flying high, but not too high. Because you don't want to get too close to that sun and become like Icarus. All right? Peace out, y'all. This is Doc Ock signing off. <laughs>